This is... Wow! What a week. What a week. Politrix. Politics. Welcome to Wow What a Week, hashtag Politrix. He's someone whom we could send to an airport to greet many politicians, even Russian ones. And he's also someone who could keep a conversation going long enough for the person to even get arrested. Please give a wild welcome back to Butsang Mutimuame Muilwa. What's up, Mr. B? As Butterflies, good morning. Morning to the viewers in the cold Jordan. And, uh, yeah, well, greeting politicians at the airport. Yes, sir. Sadly, I will not have an opportunity to go and welcome President Putin. They've ruined that opportunity. They've ruined my opportunity. You know, I was very close to the Russian ambassador. I had my ticket to be part of the delegation. Now, 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 now it's a mess, you know. But let's save that uh, for, for a bit later. Let's talk about you and the CCMA. So you uh, took your employer uh, that fired you for writing a book to the CCMA uh, because you were told that you had not declared that you'd written a book. You went to the CCMA and uh, you were told by the CCMA that you should be granted, that they should grant you access to your office. Yeah. So that you can look for these documents. Yeah, for proof. That for I proof. Get in the company. And so you, that, you, that you what transpired. Proof. Well, that has been my position for the last, what, uh, 14 months? Yes. To say I've declared. Yeah. There is proof in my office. Allow me access to my office to produce proof. And they've been refusing for the last 14 months until the commissioner of the CCMA put his foot down. Mm. In the evening of a Tuesday, the 4th of, of what is this month, July, mm. and he said, when we leave CCMA, all of us with our lawyers, we must walk into my office and they must allow me access to look for that document. If I get it, good for me. If I don't, tough luck, he will make a decision based on what he had at hand. Yes. And guess what? I did not even find the document. The employer found the document because they didn't allow me to touch anything. Mm -hmm. And and they found the document that I declared my company. Mm -hmm. And uh, the CCMA had said we shouldn't come back. We should email it in less than 48 hours of emailing it. And the award was given. And then I was awarded a victory. Absolute victory. Absolute meaning the employer was wrong substantially mm -hmm. and materially. You know, uh, uh, following procedures, uh, you know, procedure I learned substantially, they were wrong. Mm. And he ordered me, uh, this was the funny part, the CCMA commissioner ordered me to go back to work on Monday the 17th. And uh, that, that, this is the highlight of one week, yes. Yeah? So, 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 so Monday, the past Monday, yeah. I was ordered to return to work. But I must assure our viewers, followers and listeners that even if I'm back at my formal work or professional work, this show will continue to happen. Sure, sure. There are just things that we can't talk about from now moving forward. Mm. Uh, I can't talk about anything that has to do with transport, mm. that has to do with border management. Sure. Uh, those topics politically, I can't talk about mm. them now. Anything else will just continue. So Monday, did you go to work? Uh, I did, right? I was very tough. I woke up very early in the but morning. Why did you go to work? Because you knew they were not going to let you into the building. Look, I have to respect the law. You yeah. see, I, I, I always said I, I respect the law. The court order was there. My lawyer said, you have to respond to the court order. You have to report for it. But I also need to work. Mm. You know, I need to go and work for my income. And I was missing my colleagues. I was sure. missing my work. I've been complaining about that. So I got there and I was kept there at reception like a criminal waiting for almost three hours until the big bosses came to meet me for approximately 20 minutes and mm. told me, you're not coming in here. Yeah, we know there's a court order, but you're not coming in here. Go back home. Go and do what you want. We're taking this matter for review. Hey, so, so they're appealing it. So as Ramukhulaka will say, it's actually called a review. As Ramukhulaka will say, it's like in a divorce case. Mm. When when the case ends, most of, of legal processes, when a case ends, and this is what people should learn, that's actually the start or the beginning of the real battle. Sure. So it's, it's a, it's a short-term celebrated victory. But you know what matters to me most fresh? I've been vindicated. Mm. You know, I, I don't care how long this will take. I don't care what they say. An independent professional legal person has come up with a damning report, you know, 18 page report to even say he doesn't understand how did this thing end up in a disciplinary hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, that's what matters. My name has been cleared. I can move on with my life. Uh, they can go on review. They have the money and that's the problem. They've got the authority. Mm -hmm. They've got the public funds. They've got the money to fight a lone me who's without an income. And that's the main bet. I'm sure. fighting Goliath. But it smells personal, though, because anyone 
who knows to do the right thing would do the right thing. Uh, and if it's personal, then they'll make sure that they don't do the right thing. Maybe we should say it's political. This is a political platform. Mm. Maybe it's it's more political than personal. I was assured by you know my superiors that no, 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 but son, this is not personal, my brother, so and so. I, I think it's more political than personal. Uh, uh, but that's something I will deal with. I will let the legal process to, 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 to you know, prevail and to run. For now, we can enjoy the politics of the week. Mm. Uh, it started there. It started with me being in the limelight fighting, you know, the government. True. True. And uh, and yeah, but it's a victory that I knew it would happen. Mm. Uh, it, just, it was just when will it happen? True. Uh, legal processes take time. They are very tedious and they take time. There's been a very painful and hard process, but I kept on smiling face. I kept on talking politics with the followers and engagements with you. That kept me alive. That kept me sane. Mm. Otherwise, I would have been insane. Sure. But uh, I'm looking forward. I had declared that I'll go back to work the 1st of August. Maybe my, my, my tongue is more powerful than the commissioner's instruction. The 1st of August is still coming. We still yes. have like yes. two more weeks mm. for to the 1st of August. So anything can happen between now and the 1st of August. All right. And I'll keep praying. In fact, since you're going to court, it seems you're going to court, let's stay in the courts. Um, former President Jacob Zuma and the courts. Hey, we are running the country by courts. Now <laughs> we have spoke about it. Look, uh, it, it's a very complex situation. I've heard even people talking about a, a presidential pardon, you know, a, a political in, interference or so. That will not be the right direction for politics to intervene. So for those that have missed the whole story, so what, what's the latest regarding President? Well, the, the latest would recall so, that uh, the, the Commissioner of uh, uh, the, the Department of Justice and, and Correctional Services, so the Correctional Services Commissioner had appealed to the uh, Supreme Court of Appeal, the SCA, mm -hmm. that the decision to release uh, uh, President Jacob Zuma on, on medical parole mm -hmm. Uh, it, it should be, you know, endorsed by the court. But the court overturned that decision and they said the commissioner was wrong. He was not supposed to have done that against the recommendation of the uh, parole committee or parole board. So basically they're saying he must go back. So to basically, actually, what should happen after that court order? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mr. Jacob Zuma was supposed to report to the escort prison that afternoon or that evening or the following day. Mm -hmm. But we all know that he is in Russia for medical attention at the moment. Uh, that's what's supposed to happen. So, but there's options. The commissioner may use his discretion, mm. and the court has mentioned it uh, in, the, in the judgment to say, unless the commissioner uses his discretion to say the number of days mm. that President Zuma has spent outside prison can be taken into consideration in him going back into prison. And when you do the, now it's coming mathematical and technical, mm. when you do the calculations, the number of days he has spent in prison and outside prison on parole, it has already qualified him mm. to be on parole. Mm. But a conditional parole like house arrest and, and the, the conditions of house arrest are, are very simple. He will not be allowed to leave a, a, a certain district or the house. Mm. He is not allowed to take drugs or alcohol. So President Zuma will survive this one. He's not on drugs or alcohol as far as I know. He, he, he doesn't like alcohol. And, and, and the other condition is that it is the commissioner again who has mm. those powers vested in him by the act whether you want to invoke that or not so it is his decision and to determine that but again you know this this was a, a very minus court uh, you know uh, what you call section one or level one of crime mm -hmm. less than 24 months imprisonment you can stay for two thirds is too much mm -hmm. two months in prison then you, you are eligible to go out but they will take a lot into consideration the age your health your conduct and things like that i i think the best option in this instance is for the commissioner and this personal view, the commissioner to, to exercise his rights and take into consideration the days mm -hmm. President Zuma has been out on parole. So the, 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 the effect is he must, even if the commissioner says, I'm telling him, but he must go for one day in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And then the commissioner must make a decision and then, and then he comes out either few, after a few hours or the following day. I think that will be the best option for peace sake in the country. And we know that the country was divided regarding this judgment. What do you say to people who say that if you're going to keep someone out of prison for peace sake, then you're being held hostage? And where do you draw the line then when it comes to certain people who might need to be put behind bars? Well, look, there are people who are in prison for minor crimes, stealing a chicken, you know, uh, in, in, in a supermarket, mm. and we're keeping them in prisons. But in this instance, I was just explaining 
the powers that the commissioner has within the legal parameters, not as a favor, not as a political, I'm against a political decision. We know that President Ramaphosa will not pardon him. He won't exercise that right. And it's also an exercise. He won't just wake up as President Ramaphosa to say, I'm pardoning uh, uh, President Zuma. The, the, he does it in batches. Normally, it's a number of people. Mm -hmm. So I think the best way is to stick to the legal parameters. It will make the parties that took the commissioner to court, whether it's NGOs, whether it's the opposition party, it will make them to say he now acted within the legal parameters. Sure. Then, then everybody is equal before the law. But I, I personally think that, uh, and, and if I was sitting in that position, I will exercise what is prescribed by the law. All right. So, President Putin of uh, Russia will not be attending the BRICS summit in August, but the DA are saying they are still going to court regarding this matter. Yes. What a guan, what's going on? Well, look, uh, uh, remember the ANC had taken a resolution. Uh, that they must revisit the, 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 the being a signatory of South Africa must be of, of the ICC. The DA as an opposition party in South Africa is in favor of the ICC. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so funny. The ICC charter or whatever treaty, you know who was in the forefront of that? South Africa. Mm -hmm. The formation of the ICC mm -hmm. in the early 90s, South Africa was one of the first parties who went in. President Mandela was one of the people because we were under the impression as a nation that time that it will be used to can deal with atrocities of, of humanity or against humanity like apartheid, murder, and wars. That was the thinking of President Mandela at that time. Unfortunately, it was abused by the West. Mm. The DA still want it to be effective because uh, now remember, they won the first leg of forcing President uh, uh, Ramaphosa to can reveal what was on the secret affidavits to, to court regarding President Putin. Yes. They regard it as a victim. And I think if you look, you know, I, I thought of something. Have you noticed that only the DA in South Africa wins against President Ramaphosa? Something that people have been observed. Only the DA, they take President Ramaphosa to court, they come out victorious. Only. Everybody else loses. What are you implying? I, I, no, 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 no. I've, I, I'm not implying. I've said it openly <laughs> in this platform that our courts are not independent. Mm. You know, our courts have, uh, uh, based on paper and acts of parliament, mm. they are having a historical racist position. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's becoming clear. But we also know that they did a loved President Ramaphosa until he, he started not touring their line. Then they started dealing with him in courts. And, and uh, maybe it's because the DA knows the laws better. Maybe because they apply the laws better. Mm. And they enforce the law. I mean, like the ICC whether we are pulling out or not. I heard four different statements from, from the ANC regarding the DA issue. Friki Leon Balula, the Secretary General, goes and says something as if he's talking to the EFF or on behalf of the EFF. Then the, the, the president goes and talks that I'm engaging my brief counterparts and, I, and, and, and something that Derek did, there is section or clause 97 of the ICC treaty, which South Africa tried to invoke uh, to say they should give them a leeway in this process. In other words, they should allow them for President Putin to visit without being arrested. South Africa tried to use that. The ICC was not budging. Mm. Then you have Deputy President uh, uh, Paul Machatilo of the ANC in the country talking the ANC line to sure. say this I ICC is not trading the line. And then I listened very, in a very interesting interview with the spokesperson of the ANC. I forgot the lady's name of the ANC. A very lengthy interview. And he was actually asked, or she was actually asked on that interview, if uh, uh, the Secretary General Figile Mbalula is not taking the party line. And you know what she said? She said, no, 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 no. Comrade Figile can be asked that question on the side. I'm talking on behalf of the party now. What is, so you could see the different tones and languages between the ANC parties. You know what should save the ANC? They must not stop all talking. They must let official positions be communicated by the official spokesperson. Then, then they will draft. But now everybody's talking and it's confusing the nation. Mm. You know, Derek is saying this, the president is saying this, the LG is saying this, then the spokesperson of the ANC is saying something different. But uh, thumbs up to the DA, uh, we have to be fair where it's fair. Uh, they have actually pushed President Ramaphosa to obey the laws that we have signed into treaties. But, but what do you think of his statement talking about how we might have been invaded? Um, uh, I listen. <laughs> I listen to the to the spokesperson of of uh, Kremlin. You know the the, the Russian uh, seat of parliament saying that was an overstretched statement. I I think President Ram. I don't know whether it was a statement in passing or what, but I think or the media read up. But I think it was a reckless statement. 
why Russia invading South Africa with the relationships we have for what? Mm. Uh, what Russia said officially, and they explained it again during the week, they said, you know, arresting or, or charging or, or, or capturing a head of, of any state, and it's an attack on that nation. And it's, that's a, a it's a declaration of war. It's a declaration of war, and that's a fact. It doesn't mean war of scat missile. Look, we won't survive one missile from Russia as a nation, and Russia will not go into that extent. But I think it was a far-fetched statement. We should have not gone that route. President Ramaphosa should have actually waited until the court decision. Yes, he did, because he spoke on Wednesday after the court decision. Mm -hmm. But but not uh, at a weight like a declaration of war. Now, also, he is not giving us as a nation a balanced statement to say, okay, if we arrest Putin, this will happen. So if we don't arrest Putin, he should have also brought the nation into communism. If we don't, mm. what are the consequences? And they were silent on that part. So they didn't give the nation a balanced statement to say, we may suffer the agua, you know, a, a, a loss. We may suffer economically. We may lose friendship with the West. But let me tell you, with the BRICS thing, I think it's a, it's a little bit of a step backwards. This is my view regarding President Putin not coming. One, is it too much of a coincidence that President Zuma is in Russia at the moment? Mm. Obviously, met President Putin as friends and, and as, as statesmen as well. And, and, and I think, and this is, this is my, I, I tried to, to suck information from the Jacob Zuma Foundation and they refused last night uh, to, to say, did President Zuma play a role? And this is what I think. I think he played a role in persuading President Putin to finally say, don't come. Mm. Why? The lessons of Gaddafi. The way a, a, a Colonel Muammar Gaddafi of Libya was taken out. You must remember President Zuma was in the forefront with people like the former ambassador William Sapo trying to persuade NATO, the no-fly zone, and all those things. Mm -hmm. And they tried their level best. To an extent that at some stage, President Zuma had even invited President Gaddafi to say, a, a calm and hide in South Africa, they won't bomb you when you are here. And Gaddafi said, no, I would rather die in Libya, yeah. as I've always said. And I think this is what happened. I'm not taking anything away from the fact that President Ramaphosa had engaged the president of, of Brazil, Lula da Silva, the, the, the prime minister of India, Morosi, and as well as Xi Jinping of China. He had engaged them as member states of BRICS because we are the host, but BRICS works like SADAC. It works on consensus. There must be consensus amongst the five member states. So the last person who was left was President Putin to say, okay, I agree with the rest of the people. Sure. I will not come and send the Minister of Foreign, of, of Foreign Affairs to come and attend. Who's a very senior, you know, government official. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I know a lot of people, the South African Communist Party, myself, the EFF, and many South Africans are very disappointed because people are saying, we wanted show, mm -hmm. we wanted to see uh, what would happen. But uh, having said all of that, though, would you say we've dodged an Agoa bullet and possibly other bullets by this latest development? Well, look, it's a, it's a balanced outcome. We have, we have successfully, uh, when you look at diplomatic relations with the West or the NATO member states and the G7, as well as the Agoa, you know, a, 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 a treaty, we have dodged that bullet. We don't have to be dealing with that after. So it is actually also a punch balloon, you know, to the West because they waited for drama and action and all that. Uh, I, 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 somebody asked me, will this ruin relationships with Russia? I, I don't think so because there were engagements. I don't think uh, uh, we have ruined relationships with Russia or with BRICS member states. But I've got a fear of, now this is, this is how the West the imperialists operate. Mm. Infiltration is one of their biggest truths. And I've got a fear like BRICS is being infiltrated. Like a number of the former West aligned member states, they want to come to the summit as observers, as applicants, mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. Is it not that BRICS member states should be worried that NATO and the G7 are planting their spies into BRICS in order to dislocate it or to take it away from the intended path? It is just, it is good for unity. It is good for another force, but BRICS member states must be very worried, very concerned about these new babies who want to join BRICS at this juncture. When there's an ICC uh, a warrant of arrest out for one of the founding members, China, China and, and, and Russia are the first founders of, of BRICS. And I always tell people there was another wing 
of BRICS before. Yep. There was IPSA, India, Brazil, South Africa. Mm. And and I can talk with authority on that one because I was based in Brazil when IPSA was formed. Sure. You know so mm. there was IPSA, the, 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 the Council of the South-South Corporation, India, Brazil, South Africa. It was existing as a body. And when these two giants, Russia and, and Brazil, started showing their economic, political, and military relations, then IPSA joined BRICS. You know, the IPSA members, they joined BRICS to form BRICS. So, so these five member states, if, if I was the leaders of those countries, I'd be very jealous of BRICS. I will guard it with pride and jealousy that the imperialists of the West must not infiltrate BRICS and, and, and take it out of the internet path. But also, they want to come in and observe what? Yes, yeah, it's spying. Like, for what? It's like, going to spy him, Baba. It's, 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 also, it's also going to engage. Remember, there are member states that will be approved on this mm, meeting. Mm, mm. The West is not going to sit and fold their arms. They are going to come and on the sides, they will have dinners and, and, and you know. And deals. And deals with the member states who have joined to say, but we have been friends. We're not Egypt and we're not Saudi Arabia. We've been friends. Are you teaching us for BRICS? So there'll be a lot of. South Africa is going to be a battleground for political, uh, international political deals in the month of August. And you know what Batswana say? Mm. So the wind will be blowing left, right, and center on international politics come the month of August. And I hope we as a nation are ready to take a firm. You know this, uh, a, a fine threat setter, you know, and we should, we should move away from that because deals will be done, agreements will be entered into. And if we don't take a position, very clear position on what we want out of this BRICS process, we may, we may be a founding member of BRICS, but we'll be overtaken by other countries and be left behind. You know, in the middle of all this, did you see that on, on Wednesday evening, going to th at midnight on Wednesday, going to Thursday, the 20th, uh, uh, President Putin, and I expected that, mm. uh, President Putin on Wednesday, they actually bombed uh, a plant of, pro of grain production in, in, in Ukraine. I did expect that. Yes. And the worst is, they put a declaration on naval ships movement that from midnight to the 20th, Thursday, the 20th of, of, of July 2023, mm. they are now saying on the Black Sea, if they see any naval movement on the Black Sea, they will uh, go into Ukraine port. They will, they will take those naval movements and those ships to be carrying weapons that are aiding Ukraine in a war. So they're going to take them up. They send a warning and it, start, it started on Thursday night at midnight. But also remember, there was also the the agreement initially that ships would be allowed. I think it was through the Black Sea yes. to carry, especially grain, grain. Um, to Africa and other parts of the world. And um, that um, agreement expired this it week. It expired this past week and on Tuesday night. Yeah, and Russia saying we we are done. Actually, when it expired on Tuesday, on yeah. Wednesday, mm -hmm. they bombed the green plant. Yeah, and I said so. It's a blow to Africa and the world. Uh, Europe is dependent solely on Ukraine's grain mm. for their cereals and what what you know. So it, it there's a blow. Then now this war is being intensified. And and you see, sometimes politicians when they sit in boardrooms and talk the warrant of arrest, they are not looking at the main factor. The main factor now is that the entire Europe and parts of Africa are going to suffer with this. So on Wednesday they bombed the grain plant. On Thursday they passed a, a law that says any naval movement in the sea, whatever it's carrying, mm. that's moving to the port of Ukraine, they will destroy it. Yeah. And that's that's very dangerous. So, do we stay within, a st stay a signatory to the Rome Statute or not? Now that we're here. Fresh. Now that we have respected it. To the, to the, to the last, to the end. And there's a resolution of the political party that's leading in the country. I think it's time to let this go. Uh, until the ICC changes its conduct, I think we sh uh, the South Africa must implement the resolution of the ruling party and we must leave that statute. Then we, there is nothing keeping us there. It's really that it, it failed to even prosecute the apartheid era murderers. Mm. F.W. D. Clark was a president of the country. He was a murderer. They killed people. He authorized many. You understand? So why is the South Africa not going to ICC and say arrest the Clark? Charge the clerk, let the clerk go to Den Haag and face the criminal charges. Why? So we are not using it to our advantage. It is actually, you know, creating problems for us to be there. But the, the other problem is, I listen to ANC leaders, all of them, they come only now 
and talk about how the ICC treaties not fair. Uh, what about Palestine, Israel issues? What about America killing mm -hmm. the Iraqi children and Afghan children? Why now? Why do you want to say it doesn't work like that in law? You can't say because fresh is drinking, driving. Uh, arrest fresh, then you can also arrest. It doesn't work like that. Mm. They have been quiet about this and they want to take advantage to say, I but ICC, you can't ask us to arrest Putin when you have in charge, when you have been done. And you don't you don't work like that. You respect the rule of law. Full stop. Full stop. And especially when you were the founding member, the side of, you know, we, we like signing international treaties. And, and we, we can't apply international law and international treaties in that fashion or manner. We may be taking a neutral position. Uh, uh, what do they call it? I was listening to the spokesperson of Jericho saying South Africa, uh, a non, uh, uh, non aligned, non -aligned position yeah. is coming to it. It's not working. It is making us actually look like fools in front of the international community. And I think South Africa must leave the ICC. All right. It was Mandela Day earlier in the week. And uh, two statues went up in the Eastern Cape. What are your thoughts on that? Somebody must just tell me the costs of mm. the statues. I, I followed a, a, a tweet trend of the people of the Eastern Cape. Mm. The funny thing is the ANC leaders and the government leaders they don't see anything wrong with this. Look, South Africans love Madiba. He is the father of the nation, blah, 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 what, what. It's okay. We'll... And, and if anyone knows his contribution, it's the people of the Eastern Cape. Of the Eastern Cape. You don't, they, you don't need a statue to remind them. They, it's their child, you know. They, but, but again, I, I think, this is my personal political position. One, it's a waste of money. Because these statues, they cost thousands of hundreds of thousands of rents, if not millions. Not a couple of million, yeah. Yeah, if not millions, plus the party, mm. plus the president flying there with the entourage and all that, okay? And, and, and this is in a province that has not seen delivery at a level that they ought to have seen. A, a province that place. is officially the poorest in the country. Officially. Makes Eastern Cape mm. is the poorest province in this country. That is the second, or if not the third province that is voting the, the ruling party into power. Most, most votes, second or third, they come from the Eastern Cape. And, and you take millions to erect a statue of a late statesman that has been respected throughout the world. When the people of UNU, his people, UNU, mm. they don't have roads, mm. they don't have clean water. Those millions could have at least made one road to school or to a hospital. Mm. At some stage, the Eastern Cape was buying a uh, bicycle, uh, you know, uh, ambulances. You know, they could not be used. You know why? Because mm. there were no roads for those bicycles to take. Oh, those, those bicycles. Those bicycles, those bicycles, 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 whatever yes, you call yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. Understand? Mm. There are no roads. And you take money to erect a statue. I think it's an insult to, to, to the people of Tunu as well as I think the other one. And maybe it uh, is to his, to his legacy. Because what would he say of the current state of affairs? One of the reasons I don't want memorial services or funerals when I die, I want to be cremated from where I've collapsed, is I don't want people who didn't pay honor to me or who will go and celebrate with expensive alcohol my life when I was not drinking expensive alcohol, I was drinking cheap wine. And as then, I, I don't want that. Mm. People die of hunger in this continent. And you see there's a funeral and everybody's eating when somebody died of hunger. What kind of human beings are we? The people of the Eastern Cape, they should have not accepted that. Yes, I know people are saying it may improve tourism. One, it may. People will, who will fly from all over the world to go and look at the statue of Mandela in Tata or in Unu. Yes, people go to the area of Unu, especially, you know, uh, Europeans, to go and see where uh, President Mandela was born, mm. where he grew up, you know, heading cattle. It's okay. But will the erection of the statue increase the numbers? I, I mean, let's apply our mind. If people have been going there, let's say 5,000 people go there per annum, will it become 10,000 now because of a statue? That statue is already on social media now. Our politicians don't think. It's on social media. If I want to see that stage, I can zoom on my phone. I can I can actually take a screenshot on my phone and then and, 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 and then I put myself next to that stage and I say to people I was there. What, what difference will it make in the lives of people? And this is this is the kind of political thinking we are supposed to be thinking. We have spent millions of rent in this country changing street names. I get lost when I come to Jobek. You know, I see most of my heroes, Miriam Makebas streets but i don't know i still look for ill love and harassing and what what not to say i admire those things but that's the joke i know yeah except except that you guys are are 
are banning, are bombing Jobek now. So it's very scary. That's why I'm wearing track suits and turkeys today. I was preparing myself ready to run. So run in case there's gases coming out and explosions. Mm -hmm. In fact, let's talk about that explosion quickly. Um, because the first thing I thought was Buramacha <laughs> Ben. No, 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 true story. That's the first thing I thought. Uh, first thing I thought was it must be a terrorist attack. Yeah. Could it be a terrorist attack? Should we be worried? Nah, nah. The, the, the Buramacha has been paralyzed. Mm. Uh, I think the Buramacha are resting in Orania. They are protecting what they have. I don't think so. It worried me that it actually, you know, you know, black people, we are cursed. Mm. I, I, I swear, we are cursed. This explosion, why didn't it happen in Zanchin, where there's business and rich people? Why, where there's taxes that are carrying solely black people? You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, Bridge Street is the busiest taxi street of Johannesburg. And it happened there. I don't think it's a terrorist attack. There was also allegations, and, and I listened uh, uh, very clearly after the incident happened. Mm. Sums up, City of Joburg, the reaction, clap hands. Mm. Really, I've seen the EFF opposing that thing. They were opportunists to say uh, they don't give a, a plan, long-term plan, but you can't give a long-term plan on the, on the emergency. The City of Joburg has done administratively a tremendous good job. The, the mayor was there. The premier came to support them of how they... All MMCs that were affected, roads, and I hear the MMC of of of, of roads, Kenny Kunia, and is saying it is too much of a coincidence that a few weeks ago the same gas explosion happened in the eastern in Popsbeck, which is a few kilometers away from Jobet, and they suspected that he didn't say it's them. He was, he was clear to say. It's too much of a coincidence that that one was led by the Zamazamas and the gas explosion. And the same thing has happened in the center of Jobek. Other people were saying, uh, but Jobek does not have a mine underground lead. But mm. people who have done mining engineering, they will tell you that the impact and the effects of mining, it doesn't run only where you are mining. It can go a certain distance because mm. these people drill and dig to the belly of the earth. Sure. And, and, and therefore, I'm not, I didn't study science at school, but the little knowledge I know is that the mix of chemicals that mining uh, uh, companies used yesterday, 50 years, 60 years back, even 100 years back, mm. it may be the impact of that, the, the mining gases, the mining chemicals. The methane, methane, the gas, methane. et cetera. But, mm. uh, but also what makes me say more that is because the, uh, the Jobert gas, I, I forgot what's the name of the company mm. officially, they've come up and they say so far, in the last few days they've tested, there is no leak in any of their gas pipes that are running mm. underneath the city of Jobek. So what is, what is it? You know, it is not the Zamazamas. There was never mining under, immediately under Jobek. Mm. It is not the, 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 the gas of Jobek gas company. So it leaves us to think it is the after effect of the mining that happened around the coal mines of Jobek yesterday. Mm. It leaves me to say that. But I wish the country had a law. And this is where Gwede Mantashe must start, you know, uh, jumping up and if he can jump, you know, uh, uh, with that belly that's seven times the size of mine. Uh, uh, to look at the law, Australia, for example, mm. has a law on, on, on mining that says a mining company that mines in an area, they have an act or a clause that says they will be responsible for that mining area for 100 years after they've closed the mine. Uh, yes. So from the day you close the mine, 100 years after, you are still responsible mm. for care, for protection, and for securing those areas. Mm. I wish South Africa, as a mining country, we're, we're one of the biggest mining countries in the world, we should come with a law that forces the mining companies to can take care of the mining area for years after mining. They come and they mine for 50 to 100 years, and we let them go. I don't think it's a wise move. If they were they were forced to implement that, we wouldn't be stuck with the Zamazamas. Sure. Because then they would have, you know, been forced to. But I agree with the uh, 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 police commissioner, uh, Elias Mawela, when he said, let us wait for the professional's report to come out. And let's hope it won't take seven weeks to come out because it will guide us. When professionals have did, they've went in, they've seen. And sadly, uh, uh, before we went on show, there was already one casualty, you know. Yes. And uh, last night there was 12 uh, injuries, but now they found the body. Uh, uh, and so there's already one casualty. But the other danger is the buildings, residential and business buildings mm -hmm. within the area that the explosion happened. Uh, I think the, the, the city of Jobek and the country, we, we should stand up as a nation, not only as Jobek. To, because this can happen anywhere where there's mining in the country. Yeah, it's very dangerous, but thanks God, lives has been spared. 
you know, we 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 feel sorry for that one lost life. One lost black life means a lot to some of us. Mm. In closing, can we wrap up with the PAC Azapo agreement? What's going on? What are we agreeing on here? What's going on? Uh, you know, I'm quickly going to take a moment and, and give you a background of where, where does this argument come from. It is, it is not a new thing. One, it is a decision in the right direction. People have been calling out for that to say Africanists have no differences at all in policy. Even in the 80s when there was violence between political parties, UDF and Azapo, UDF and PAC, or PAM, Incat and ANC and all that, there was never a, an instance in South Africa where the Africanists, meaning Azapo and PAC, mm. uh, were fighting each other. That's one element. Sure. But historically, people should know that the Black Consciousness Movement, before Azapo was formed in the late 70s, the Black Consciousness Movement, its founding, they looked at Robert Sobukwe, the, mm. the, 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 the founding leader of the PC. They looked at Sobukwe as their leader. They went, when, when, when you look at history, uh, Biko himself went to meet when they were both banned by the apartheid government. Biko and Sobuk were met. Mm. So, so the 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 the, the PNC and Azapo in the base of calling South Africa Azania made brought them closer together. Black consciousness is talking about the mental ideology and how black people should conduct themselves and, and you know uplift themselves. The Pan Africanist Congress was talking about the land question. So the land question between these two political parties brought them together. It mm. ironed out differences. But beyond beyond uh, uh, and Sobukwe and, and Biko Miti, leaders of the Black Christians movement, the founding leaders, the South Kupas and the, the Laban Mabasas, they looked at Sobukwe as their father. And, and people do not know that Laban Mabasa himself, the leader of Azapo, mm. he played a very instrumental role in the in the funeral of, of Sobukwe. Azapo played a very big role in the funeral of, of Sobukwe. They, they didn't say he's a PAC leader. They were hands-on. Mm because they looked at Sobukwe as their father as well. But again, you look at, at Sasso leaders, you know, uh, which was a black conscious movement. Sasso leaders, the South Coopers, and, and many of them, they went to Sobukwe. They looked at Sobukwe, and they also looked at Zephania Mutuping, who was the accused number one in the 1976 battle trial. Mm -hmm. Zephania Mutuping was the leader of the PC. Sasso leaders looked up to Uncle Zef Mutuping as their leader. So you can see where the relationship comes from. Mm -hmm. Moving fast forward, in the late 70s, when Azapo was formed, the leaders of Azapo at that time and PAC met in the late, in the early 90s, late 80s, and they signed what they called the Gadoma Agreement, a Gadoma Agreement in Zimbabwe. Okay. The PAC was led by the then chairperson, who was the APLA commander, uh, 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 they called him River, uh, Mlambo, Johnson Mlambo. Mm -hmm. Azapo was led by Msibuti Mangena. And they signed an agreement how they threw a liberation movement should work together towards the liberation of South Africa and work in unity. So I regard this uh, milestone agreement and engagement this uh, the, the past weekend between Azapo and the PAC as actually reigniting the Kadoma agreement that was signed by the two leaders of the PAC and Azapo. Mm. But, but first, looking historically as well, new political parties are talking coalition. Azapo and PAC, they are doing what has historically happened in the continent. If you look at Frelimo, in, in Mozambique. Frelimo was a concussion of several liberation movements mm -hmm. that came up and they formed Frelimo. If you look at ZANU itself in Zimbabwe, it didn't just come up as ZANU. There was a number of political formations that came up to form ZANU. Mm -hmm. And and what PC and Azapo is doing, it's not new in the in the continent. You look at Amical Cabral and his parties in finding, you know, uh, political movements, whether in Ghana or, or, or in any other country in the, in the East uh, uh, Africa. They form or West Africa, not West Africa. They formed a coalition, for lack of a better word, mm. a coalition of liberation movements. Mm. And that became political parties at the end. I think this is long overdue. It is the right time to do it. And it will aid the two political parties to revive, you know, Pan-Africanism and Black consciousness. It will aid them towards being in parliament. But again, let me tell you, Azapo and PAC were never formed to be political parties. That's why they're doing very badly mm -hmm. politically. Mm -hmm. They were formed to be liberation movement. The only reason they both entered politics at a later stage, it is because they were not ready for that. They didn't enter the negotiations. Mm -hmm. Azapo missed the 1994 elections. PAC has been doing one person. You know, people were joking and saying, you see this one settler, one bullet. 
it is actually meaning one vote, one percent in power, one seat in parliament. Maybe they must dish the slug and because it has been one seat <laughs> since ever. It has never been seat. But I, I think is it for the politics of this country, for unity amongst black political parties, mm. I hope they will be joined by other black political parties. Then it will reduce that seven pages ballot paper we are faced with next year. But I think it's a move in the right direction. I just hope it, it, it becomes solidified towards the election. So ANC is in trouble. ANC is in serious trouble. What will it take for people to see um, a PAC and a ZAPO as a political option? Look, the ideology is already there. It will take a vibrant young leader. That's one thing they will need. They, they, they will have to stop the infighting Azapo, BC, PAC, and all the breakaways, it will take a very vibrant young leader. Mm -hmm. They don't have to go and, and tell people. People in South Africa, they don't want manifestos. They don't eat manifestos. Yeah. They need a vibrant young person. And Gilas is a typical example of a politician that South Africa needs. Someone who looks nice, who talks the language of the people on the ground. Mm -hmm. And people are tired. They, people have been saying, we say the EFF is tricky, but we don't trust Julius, and we don't have any other alternative. So what they can do, this uh, patriotic front, is, is to position themselves for the people to say, now there is an alternative mm. of former liberation movement which are led by people we know and we can trust. So my advice to them is that come with vibrant young people. Mm. Don't, don't bring the oldest. They live on Mabasas and the current president. Of, they must come with somebody totally different center to can lead this patriotic alliance and go to the elections as a patriotic uh, front. I think that that will help them a lot. Someone young people can relate to. Sorry? Someone young people Somebody can relate to. young people can relate to. People who are saying, we don't trust EFF. EFF is the extension of the ANC. Where do we go? You understand? And people are, black people are not going to go to the DA. It has reached its ceiling with blacks. Uh, but they need somebody they can relate to. In the bigger scheme of elections, and to your average South African voter, does the manifesto and what you stand for really add any value to your campaign as a party? Less than, less than, I can tell you, I, I can say 6%, but less than 10% of the voters, they vote on the basis of the manifesto. South Africans historically were voting emotionally yes. for, for liberation movement. Mm -hmm. And some historically, the people will say, my grandmother, my father, my uncle, my parents have been members of a certain liberation movement, therefore I'm sticking to it. There's nothing else I know. Mm -hmm. There are manifestos in, in my books, a very, very few percentage, not even of the nation, of the voters mm -hmm. vote on the basis of the manifesto. It is good to have a manifesto which will guide you. Yeah, it's your Bible. Power. It's your Bible. It's yes. your Bible. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, it's more rhetoric. It's more being visible. It's more being seen. Uh, you know, it's more seen the placards. You know, I've known people who have said, and I've met who have said, you know, I went there not knowing what I will vote. I will decide when I look at that ballot paper. Mm -hmm. So it's like playing a uh, moraba raba. You know, people see them like, ah, let me close my eyes. Where my pen drops, I'll vote there. But I think promises, manifestos are not going to work for South Africans anymore, except people who are politically naive, you know, sorry to say that. But uh, uh, we are not going to go and convince the youth, if I was a politician. Fresh, I will target youth. I will take everything I have to target youth at universities. I'll talk their language. I'll encourage them to register and say, you know this story of them say, register to vote. It will just register. I will not say that. I will say register to vote me. Yes. Not register to vote. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know why are they shy to help the IEC. It is the duty of the IEC to tell the youth and the nation to register. It's not the duty of political parties. Political parties must say, register to vote me. But uh, it's going to be a tough one because our people are tired. I, 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 will, I will forever make noise about online voting. Mm. Uh, if we had that, we are going to get an absolute turnover. Uh, on, on, absolute. We are gonna re 22 million people are eligible to vote in South Africa. I can tell you, if we had online voting, 21 million were going to vote. Yeah. But, but the ruling party is not going to allow that. It is dangerous for them it will take them out of power. It's not going to happen anytime soon. They are passing beautiful laws. Uh, to uh, You know, this week that has passed, President Ramaphosa signed into law the 12th official language of the Republic of South Africa. Long overdue. Last week we spoke about the bill about menstruation. This week is a bill. It's an act now of parliament about the 12th language, the sign language. And maybe, maybe after five years, uh, when Paul Mashadila from Alex comes into power, we will see the 13th language 
uh, which is which is capital. You know, uh, we we need that. There's languages there that have been talked in South Africa. Yeah. yeah. So so uh, we, we should look at the electoral act uh, bill. It should be amended, and online registration and voting should be the next important thing we do as a nation. And I think on that note, let's call it. We are almost here for an hour now. Really? Yeah, it's almost an hour now. It's Putin. <laughs> <laughs> I blame President Putin for all this. How can that man withdraw at this stage? I, I, I know you're disappointed. I'm very disappointed, but yeah, it's politics. They've tricked me this time. You know, I've, I wish President Putin would have come to Africa. But anyway, let's focus on what politics will bring us and what is coming in front of us in the, in the, in the next week. I hope that in the next week or two, mm. when I sit on this platform, I'll, I'll be in a suit and a tie as an employee of the state. This thing of the state playing games with me, it should come to an end. Ladies and gentlemen, our political Botsang Mutimuame Muiluang. Where do we find your social media? Uh, Where do we buy your book? Uh, the book, again, botsangm at gmail.com. You can email me there or just WhatsApp 082 My team is very responsive. I'm getting positive feedback. Mm -hmm. And on social media, I'm on Facebook as Botsang Mwilwa. On Instagram and Twitter, it's at botsangm. Thanks, Fresh, and thanks for the viewers. Botsang is always love and respect. We'll see you in a week. Shout out to Am Studios for hosting us, Africa Podcast Network. We are family. Our cinematographer, Pezulu Works. Our audio engineer, uh, he does all of the imaging, Otis the Flo Fraser. And our guest, Botsang Mudimwa Mimuilwa. Shout out to our creative director, Kuvesh Mohan, and our show producer, Kelezo Mudisa King. Email us at waw at africapodcastnetwork.com. Have a great political week, in spite of yourselves.